Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast. This is your host, Brittany, and today we are joined by Michael Hill. He is the CEO of Well Room Pets. Michael, thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for what you do. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to your audience about what some of the things that we're doing at Well Groomed. Yeah, so before we jump into Well Groomed, let's talk a little bit about you and your background and kind of your day to day. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I started my career at Merrill Lynch, so way back in the day, uh, and then became an entrepreneur 24 years working in the dental industry, very fragmented industry, dental manufacturing. I ended up selling that company to a small private equity group. And, you know, after 24 years as an entrepreneur, you're basically you're unemployable. So you right. kind of look around what's next. And I, my, I've been a pet enthusiast for a long time. And so this has kind of been my passion. I started doing some consulting work for a nonprofit to help other entrepreneurs start and grow and build their businesses, largely in healthcare, med- medical uh, device, things like that. But I would see um, periodically a lot of uh, dog uh, innovation, you know, people that were doing things around um, canine care. So my colleagues started giving all those projects to me, knowing that I was this pet enthusiast. My dog at the time, uh, Golden Retriever, his name was Chester. And at eight years old, uh, Chester um, died of cancer. And that had a really profound impact on kind of the next step of, in my life. And, you know, it was one of those things where Chester was with me all the time. I, he mm-hmm. was, I, we ran at the beach, you know, he was in my car all the time. But the kids, ball games, and I was coaching and they would, Chester was always there. But I miss these signs. I miss the slowdown. I miss the change in the appetite. And I think a lot of pet parents probably have a very similar experience. They just, it's our dog. It's like, you know, if you if you saw my kids on Thursday and then you didn't see them for three years, you go, look at how big your kids are. And I'm going, no, nah, it looks like you looked like last Thursday. You know, it's like right. you don't see it. And, and this kind of happens, I think, with animals. And so by the time we really noticed that something was wrong with Chester, um, went to the vet, spent about $10,000 trying to, you know, help and, uh, and ended up having to put him down. And so it was really a, a sad and very traumatic experience. And anyone who's lost a pet um, understands that. So that took me down this rabbit hole of trying to understand canine wellness. And what I learned and what I had shared with you is dogs have one of the highest occurrence of cancer of all mammals on the planet. Golden retrievers, they're number one. They're actually the number one animal that gets cancer. It's like 60 mm-hmm. something percent of dogs, of goldens get cancer. So anyway, so the idea was, how can we look at this and understand really what's happening with with canine wellness and canine health? And I'm not a healthcare professional, um, and so I knew I would never go down that road. That wasn't something I was going to do at the stage of my life. But who's touching these animals and who's looking at these animals? And so when you really looked at the ecosystem, dog groomers have their mm-hmm. hands on dogs more often, more frequently, for a longer period of time than anyone else other than the pet parent. In fact, it's about 20 times more frequently they'll see a dog than a veterinarian, and they'll spend eight times longer in every appointment hands on these dogs. And so that gives us this really unique opportunity and, frankly, I think obligation to bring more to the industry than just um, great haircuts and and lots of love and artistry and these people are amazing. But can we be intentional and and observe and track and measure and, and help the pet parents see changes in their dog's wellness and maybe we can extend the lives of these animals. So that's really what the mission was all about. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear about Chester. We, uh, my husband and I have a similar kind of story. You know, we had a Pomeranian with cancer in 2016 and we missed the signs for so long. You know, she started to slow down. We're like, Oh, she's getting older. Yeah. Uh, didn't really know she was eating less because one of the other dogs was actually eating most of her kibble. Oh, so no, the bowl really? was empty. So, you know, we're yeah. like, well, she's still eating. Uh, and it took us some time and, I think during that time, uh, even though I do all of my own grooming, I still take them in usually to get their nails clipped. I hate that task. Yeah. And so there were other professionals with their hands on her frequently. Um, and so, yeah, kind of the idea of 
could it been could have been caught sooner by someone who was hands on with her every two to four weeks? You know, would they have been able to feel something, see something, notice something? Uh, particularly with the weight loss, because you and I are not weighing our pets all the time, but they normally right. do at check in. So yeah. that makes perfect sense. And I love the innovation behind this and working pet wellness into grooming. A lot of people don't, you know, think of it that way. So tell us about well groomed pets and exactly what the company does and um, just, you know, whatever you can share with us about it. Yeah, so the dog grooming industry has been around for 2,000 years. Modern dog grooming, pretty, I mean, probably 100 years. It really has, it's been largely unchanged. The tables and the, you know, the tools that we use are, are better, uh, certainly. And the techniques and the artistry, uh, you get creative grooming, you get some amazing creative groomers out there. And so there's been some change there. But what we do, caring for and cutting and cleaning animals, that's really largely been unchanged. And so, what, what we tried to do, and so we're dog groomers, so obviously that's kind of our core thing, but what we, what we did was we built a workflow where we can um, identify and track wellness issues, very specific wellness issues. And so they fall into a handful of categories. So for example, weight, so physiological, right? So weight being one of the key physiological attributes and, and maybe one of the more significant ones. So a lot of dog groomers do weigh the dogs and they weigh mm -hmm. them uh, primarily for pricing purposes, because right. we're going to charge, you know, by how much they weigh. Um, but if we're weighing them and we track that over time, if we have a change in wellness, we can bring that to the attention of the pet parent, particularly if you have weight loss. Now, there may be reasons for that. It may not be anything to be concerned about, but mm -hmm. you definitely want to let them know that something has been happening. And so the categories, I'll give you a couple of them. Um, mm -hmm. So physical, and this is pretty common. There are some brands uh, and we celebrate them. We think they're doing a, a, a lot of good things here, but they will do physical like we do. So we do um, teeth and ears and eyes, skin, coat, nose. And we're looking, it's not just those items, but there's actually things that we drill down into. And we, we specifically are looking for um, changes in particular areas. So like, for example, in eyes, we're, we're trying to understand cloudiness. We're looking for discharge. And so there's a handful of things, ears, we're looking for odors and bacteria, cuts, mm -hmm. bruises, wounds that aren't healing. I mean, things like that. So, so we go through this physical workflow and then physiological, I mentioned weight being one of the key uh, elements there. We also do um, lump and lesion mapping. So back in from my dental days, we used to use calipers and we'd measure teeth. And mm -hmm. so we use calipers and we measure lumps and we measure lesions. We record them. We know that they're there in our software. The next time the dog comes in, we go right back to the same spot, remeasure. And then if it has grown, well, then we've got a red flag and we're going to let the pet parent know you might want to get this looked at by a veterinarian. And so we do a lot of referrals. In fact, we refer I mean, just to put up, we probably do like four or 5,000 veterinarian referrals a month oh, wow. um, just from the wellness issues that we're seeing. And I'll share a number with you. Um, a little more than 45% or about 45% of every dog that we see, we identify 2.3 wellness issues. And those numbers are going up as we get better and we train our, we have more salons opening up and we train our staffs and, and we teach them what to look for. The numbers are actually trending up. Um, and, and we think that's a great thing. We don't think that's mm -hmm. a bad thing. It's, it's important. Early intervention means earlier treatment, which means better outcomes. And so hopefully right. if we work together on this, um, we can't you know bring the dogs to the vet, but we can let the pet, parent know, pet parents know. Mm -hmm. And then we have partnerships with veterinarians so that we can send those leads to them and, and they can connect and hopefully help uh, the pet parents. We're we're looking at things like nutrition now. We're, we're how often do you feed your dog? How much do you feed your dog? We're looking at socialization. We're looking at lifestyle. So we're really leaning in heavy here. Um, part of that is to make data available to our industry, so yeah. that we're not the ones that are going to draw the correlations, Brittany. But those who are experts, the colleges, the physicians, the the the, the veterinarians, those are the, fo the the pet product companies. They can draw the correlations and begin to understand the impact of certain types of maybe environmental things or lifestyles that are leading to dogs having such a kind of a poor um, overall wellness outlook. Not, not that all dogs are, are dealing right. with it, but a big number are. Yeah. So whenever someone comes in for a visit, is it standard to kind of offer all of these pillars of wellness and health? Are they always getting that physical check, that physiological check, so on and so forth? 
Yeah, what a great question. Thank you for that. I think it's one of our our differentiators. Um, you know, in the grooming industry, it's very fragmented. Like my dental days, very fragmented. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just tell you, when I started in dentistry, there were twelve thousand five hundred competitors in my particular space. When I left, there were about three thousand. And technology was the core innovation that kind of rolled up. Technology innovation rolled up a lot of that industry. Well, dog grooming, there's over 100,000 dog groomers out there with dog grooming businesses mm -hmm. and 200,000 groomers. So very, very fragmented. So when we think as you're, it's important for dog groomers to differentiate themselves, who, who am I? What client do I serve? What market right. do I want to be in? So this is one of our core differentiators. And the answer is yes, Every single dog, even if they come in, you shared that you bring your dogs in a lot for um, just nail trims. Mm -hmm. Even table service, we're going to do a full workup. We're going to do a complete oh, wow. wellness. It's complimentary. We don't charge anyone for it. It's just information that we're collecting that we want to be really an advocate for the pet parent. It's our ethos. It's our culture. It's in our DNA. And, and, and by the way, I don't think we're the only ones that are doing. We're probably doing it more comprehensively than others. Right. But there are other great brands great dog groomers who care about this, who look at this and try to bring that information forward. Um, we intend to lead on this, but also we intend to share this information. Mm -hmm. And when pet parents leave a visit or let's say they've had several visits, do they have the access to like a portal or um, some type of reporting system where they can look at the different uh, levels of analysis or the different data points? Yeah. Another great question. Uh, yes, we have a portal for all of our pet parents. We all that information is stored for them, um, and then we also we have a we have a partnership with the American Kennel Club. All of our salons are AKC safe certified. They are also our our dog groomers are fear free certified, and um, we make sure that every franchise that opens up that they be, all become um, fear free certified. Uh, they're working on a franchise model, so it's a little bit tough. But my point is. Um, all of the information that comes, we train our teams how following the, I think, best in class services like Fear Free and AKC, how to interact with animals. And then we store all those interactions up in the pet parent portal and then we link back to it. So, for example, let's say your dog came in and your dog, we noticed that your dog had some allergies or some skin or maybe some wounds that hadn't healed. Mm -hmm. We'll give you a link to the American Kennel Club, for example, their their content on that oh. to help you get educated as a pet parent on why that's occurring, what could be some of the causes for that. And then we try to provide you with some resources as well locally in your community. Yeah, that's great. I think, you know, the what I preach on this podcast, the reason I have it is there's such a, I don't want to say a lack of resources, but I think pet parents have to go digging for them. And more often than not, you don't know what you don't know. So you don't even know to go digging for Scrappy having a rash on his belly if someone is not alerting you to it. Like, hey, he had this rash last time. It's a lot worse. It might be allergies or something else. So I think that's fantastic. So let's kind of talk about how the franchise works. So I know that you guys have franchise locations uh, or offerings across the country. And so if someone is already a groomer and they already have a shop open, is there an opportunity for them to convert over to well-groomed? There is. And, and in fact, it's, it's an industry term and it's called a conversion. So um, you nailed that. So uh, <laughs> yeah. And it, it's, it's not terribly expensive. It's obviously, it's a brand conversion, right? So you want to make sure that the brand's consistent. Then there's a training element to this. And by the way, at Wellgroom, we uh, we train regularly. It's not just training on how to run a business, but we train continually. We, we live stream into all of our stores. We have big screens all over the place. We bring in experts who, much like what you're doing today and in your podcast, you bring on folks who talk on various subjects. Well, we bring in relevant um you know, folks from the industry, experts in the industry. So we're, we're talking about financial acumen to uh, products that are being introduced into the marketplace. We talk about mm -hmm. grooming tips and techniques and um, how to bathe a dog, how to reduce anxiety in a shop, things that you should be thinking about, safety, how do you work with senior dogs? So there's a whole lot of that, and it's it's live stream. We record all that, and then we archive it in a, in a library, which we make available to all of our teams. And by the way, some of our, our training, not all, but but some of our training that we think is is super impactful, we open it up to the entire industry and we just make it available. If they want to join our pod, not our podcast, but our video streams and be a part of that and see and, and learn from that, from those experts, we make that available. Um, we just think it's our contribution to the industry. They've given us so right. much. We try to do that as well. 
And this is a question uh, that I don't have any knowledge about. Do groomers have continuing education requirements or is it just get a license <laughs> or certificate and you're ready to go? Yeah, it's a little bit of the Wild West, Brittany. I mean, the different states have different requirements. Some states do have certification and, and programs and, and many states have none. Um, mm-hmm. And to my knowledge, uh, no states have a continuing education requirement like veterinarians oh, wow. or healthcare professionals. Uh, they just they get trained and they hang a shingle or they don't get trained and they hang a shingle. Um, just yeah, it's it's just kind of the Wild West right now. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what I thought, because there's so many multitudes of groomers out there, you know, from the mom and pop shops to the ones that are attached to like a pet store or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so kind of going back to uh, individuals or entities that would want to franchise, what type of criteria do you guys require? Just generally, you know, if someone was looking and they were curious if they kind of fit the mold and if it would work for them, what do you guys normally look for? Yeah, what an important question. Um, there's a lot of folks who want to be in this space. You know, it it all starts with, well, first of all, let me just tell you how our company is organized. Our company is organized into three business units. It's our sales unit, which is uh, which is a lot about what you just mentioned. And it's it's not us selling to them or them selling to us. It really is a partnership. When you know, when you get connected to a franchise, they're with you forever. You know, you're mm-hmm. part of that brand. And so you, you need to like the people that you're working with and you need to believe in the mission and you need to understand their background. So entrepreneurs, experienced entrepreneurs who understand the entrepreneurial journey are great candidates to be a part of these kinds of businesses. Previous franchise owners who have been accustomed to the franchise industry, which is a little different. Um, those are obviously great candidates as well. We don't actually have a lot of dog groomers who buy the dog, you know, buy our brand. Um, generally, we're getting entrepreneurs, we're getting business people who are doing it. They see the big growth in the pet industry. Right. They're super passionate about dogs. They might have three or four or more mm-hmm. uh, in their homes. And this is a part of what they want to do. But I'll tell you that for us, it starts with just questions about you know, why dog grooming and you know, what do you want to do? What, what, kind of, what kind of business do you want to build? And is this a lifestyle thing? Or are you actually trying to build some wealth here and you actually want to have a market, there's no right or wrong answer. Mm-hmm. It's about fit and alignment. And so if you just want to be a dog groomer and open a salon, you certainly don't need us. You can do that without, you know, we're, we're not inexpensive to be a part of a franchise brand. You can do it cheaper on your own, mm-hmm. but we bring a lot of other resources to the table to help make sure that you're successful. Right. That's all franchises, not just us. Um, mm-hmm. So we start there just getting to know the why, why are you doing this? What do you care about? What's important to you in your life? What are your goals? And then we don't actually sell single units. We sell only multi-units. So what we call multi-territory owners. Okay. We want you to build, learn, and grow through your first business. Because once you get to the other side of that, where you are profitable and you're cash flowing, now when you go open up stores number two and three, now you're building family wealth. You know how to do it. You've got great expertise. And you you need to have a, a path for that to happen. If you just buy one and then come back a year later, two years later, those territories may be all gone. So we sell right. three and try to protect them. And so the requirements, obviously there's financial requirements, mm-hmm. but I would say the financial requirements are not really the impediment to getting into this. It's just making sure that you have the entrepreneurial mindset that, you know, that you're well connected and that you care deeply about this space. Um, and I'll just say one last thing about once we started down this journey of getting into the dog grooming space, what we learned Dog groomers in the pet industry have largely, I think, been and unfairly been sort of relegated to this sort of back office kind of entry level. Mm-hmm. You know, they just do this work in the back, and and I think I think it has really done a disservice to this industry. For us, we have said let's elevate this, and and I was taught this by other groomers, actually a couple that I that I respect greatly, have helped me understand how important it is to create an, an, and amplify the voice of groomers because the truth is. They're the center of the universe in the pet industry. They're the first to actually see changes in healthy dogs. Mm -hmm. That's largely are working with dogs that are sick or have problems. But we want to get way upstream and the dog groomers, and there's others in the ecosystem also, but I think this is really the center because they see the dogs more frequently, so they have a better opportunity. I would say the dog groomer is probably the more critical piece of the entire industry for helping to improve the lives of animals that are healthy and then dealing with those changes quickly. So that, you know, and of course I'm biased because I work in this industry, but that's our mission and that's what we're trying to do here. How many uh, locations do you guys currently have and what states are those in? Yeah. So I think we're in 
12 states now. Uh, okay. Don't quote me on that. It's 10 or 12. It's somewhere in that ballpark. Um, we, we're, at, we're at about 19, 20 that are open. Um, we have... We have, I think we have two or three opening this month. I mean, they're opening pretty rapidly right now. We, we did a lot of selling last year. Well over 100 units sold, uh, territory sold, um, and also uh, Canada now as well. So we're, oh, wow. we're in two countries, and we're looking at some other uh, space. Largely being pulled into that, we're trying to be careful about where we go and not get too far over our skis. Right. Um, but you also want to strike when the, when the iron's hot, and obviously people see the growth of the pet industry, and they, they want to be a part of that. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I would say... Um, the you know, first two years, we we severely overachieved and went through some growing pains, and yeah. uh, and now we're, we've got a nice cadence, and I think things are going pretty well for us. That's awesome. So, if people are interested in learning more or interested in franchising, uh, what is your website, or how can they find out more? Yeah, again, thank you for that. Thanks for the plug. Uh, so it's it's wellgroompets.com is our it's one of our first websites. It's actually being redone right now, but they can also go to wellgroomedopportunities.com and that speaks a little bit more to the franchising side. But you can connect on both of them. And of course they can just send me an email and I'm just M Hill Mike Hill. So M Hill at wellgroompets.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate it. Brittany, thank you. What a great program. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for tuning in to the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.